Okay, hey, uh, I'm Matt. I am Shane's editor, and uh, I live in Dallas. And if you haven't heard, um, Texas is like breaking records with this winter storm. Um, I'm out of power. It's 5:30 a.m. right now, and um, I haven't had power since like Sunday, um, which is just ironic because this episode is about how to prepare for climate change and I definitely feel like I could have done a better job. I should have bought a generator when I could. Texas could have been more prepared as well. It seems like we overestimated how much energy we could produce and underestimated just how bad the weather could actually get. They started doing rolling blackouts to try to save uh, resources for the grid, um, but Initially, they were only supposed to last like 15 minutes, uh, but 15 minutes turned into eight hours, turned into 12 hours. I mean, there's there's people who haven't had power for days. It is pretty outside though. That's the cool part. <laughs> it's kind of a strange feeling walking around outside at night. You just see all the candles and the fireplaces. There's no, there's no lights, there's no TVs, there's no street lamps. It's just, white. Anyway, um, hopefully we get power back so I can get this out. Um, but it's a really great episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Oh, shit. The power just came on. The power just came on. Ooh, that's scary. I gotta go upload the podcast! Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello everybody and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today I'm excited for my guest David Hogue is joining me today. He's uh, he's been the host of 20 science specials on PBS's Nova, five-time Emmy award-winning technology and science correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning, and the New York Times best-selling author of Pogue's Basic Series. So, uh, David, here's here's what happened. Your publicist sends me this book. I'm really excited. I get the gist of it. It arrives. I see the thickness of this thing, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's 550 pages or something like that. And I have a reading list of a mile high, as I'm sure you do as well. I have a bunch of, I have to write a quote for a guest's upcoming book. I, and I'm, and every day I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, oh my God, finally, I'm like, you know what? Let's just wing it. That's what I said to your publicist. And then I crack open your book after we schedule this. I'm like, oh my God, I could have read this. This is, <laughs> this is the most plainly worded. This is what you've done here is incredible. This book, How to Prepare for Climate Change, A Practical Guide to Surviving the Chaos. There's two, I read a lot of science books. Some, usually when they're this big, whole bunch of jargon. I'm learning neuroscience 101 through 103 uh, in in footnotes to understand what the heck is going on. And, and my gosh, all right, I'll take one more whack at the extended phenotype and see if I really fully understand it this time. And then uh, I, uh, yeah, I've read a book this thick about insect genitalia before, the most <laughs> jargony book I've ever <laughs> I've ever read and and uh and and then normally when I see a book this plain spoken doesn't say anything at all it's it's a bunch of like wishy-washy stuff I'm not getting anything out of it right your book has this incredible you've somehow uh distilled and condensed just this incredible amount of information on just page after page of i was reading just even the intro my my jaw was dropping with some of the uh some of the information that you were sharing so clearly this is this is at a level a seventh grader could read this this book and and tell their parents all about what they need to do in terms of gardening and and how to 
build their deck or, or whatever and this is absolutely cheers to you this is this is terrific this is i i hope that all of my listeners uh check this out and aren't as intimidated by the size of it <laughs> as i was um so why don't you introduce yourself a little bit Sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm David Pogue. I've been a longtime uh, tech and science reporter for the New York Times for 13 years and then uh, Nova for 10 years on PBS and most often these days on CBS Sunday morning. And yeah, this this book, I mean, you're right. I, I feel like this book is sort of a departure uh, both for me and in you know the bookstores, the bookshelves. Um, there, most of what we've heard about how to cope with climate change is um, how to mitigate climate change, like how to stop it. And there's like many, 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 many books and articles about how to make your carbon footprint smaller. And that's really important. We should all do that, you know, fly less, eat less red meat, drive an electric car, very important. But there's this other approach to climate change that climate scientists think is also very important, which is adaptation, which is accepting that some climate change is already here and is not going back. So we need to adapt in order to protect ourselves. So that was that was what this book is about, personal adaptation, you and your family. You know, like, like you said, it's uh, how to insure and how to invest and where to live, how to talk to your children, what to grow, and then individual chapters on riding out hurricanes and wildfires and floods and droughts and tornadoes and things like that. I, so yeah, I, I saw it as sort of um, something that hadn't been written and probably should be written i mean this is just so jam-packed this 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 isn't just um you forwarding your kind of specific uh take on things this is every single just about every single page has some link to some other resource uh that people can go out and check on their own to get more in-depth uh information and this is uh yeah it, it's terrific i i and this is really good for my listeners too because I, when i started this podcast uh when I started planning for it about seven years ago, I was just obsessed with evolution and, and I knew uh, there's a few topics I was going to stay away from. Chemistry, because I didn't know a thing about it and it's so scary to me. Um, physics, because I, I did know stuff about it but I it, and I feel like I can handle a physics conversation. But I, I felt like everything at that time was star talk and space and that's what gets all the, the press. And climate change stuff was that mix in between the two where I didn't feel like it was my wheelhouse and I felt like it got it got enough uh, press that I wasn't going to be adding anything with uh, with my perspective. And in the last, o over the course of, especially since COVID's happened, it's made me realize, I, I just took a class last semester on, on the psychology of trying to convey climate science and science denial. And, so, wow. and it's just made me realize um, how easy it is for everyone to get involved and how important it is and how uh, kind of the, the asymptomatic um, spread of COVID is just so similar to the asymptomatic effects of, of climate and not having the, sure, we have these wonderful adaptations to feel temperature and acute weather changes, but to to be able to really feel on a daily basis the change over, over decades and make a prediction on that going forward is something that we're just, I, I don't see any choi choice but to equip ourselves with with the with the tools to outwit some of our um, intuitive senses that if we just listen to our intuition, we'd think the earth was flat and the climate <laughs> was never going to change and everything was just going to be fine and dandy. And, um, and so I wanted to present that because you're in a good position because my listeners, my listeners haven't been hit over the head with climate stuff over and over again on this show. Uh, so you got some fresh, eager ears. And um, I, I wanted to, if, if I could, 
um, because this is this truly is a, a super pragmatic book. I'd like to start with the most controversial thing, which you already touched on a little bit, but it's on the first it's on the first line um of of the back page in red letters <laughs> it says it's too late to stop climate change so you were just alluding to this before controversial you're gonna get some blowback now for my listeners there's uh you know there's people there there's covid zero people there's people there's people that are like hey let's let it rip and there's everything in between and there isn't Science is never going to come down exactly. I, I spent about six months last year trying to figure out exactly why sloths poop in a peculiar fashion. <laughs> and the science is still sort of out on it. You couldn't really pin it down. <laughs> and so I think oftentimes listeners or, or people that are new to science just expect like, give me the answer and i want it to be perfect and i and uh and i want the magic bullet solution to everything and so i think some people might be taken back by this a little bit so can we talk a little bit about that at first it's too late to stop climate change yeah i, I mean when people talk about climate deniers um I, I don't think that's a very precise term i don't know if, i don't know uh, are we are we saying that there are people who haven't noticed <laughs> that the climate has changed, that last year's worst wildfires in recorded history out west didn't happen, that last year was not the hottest year on the planet ever recorded, that there weren't more hurricanes last year than any recorded year, that the Death Valley temperature of 131 degrees in July wasn't the hottest temperature ever recorded on the planet, that Siberia, Siberia, didn't hit 101 degrees last summer. Um, so I think th I think the number of people who say, no, 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 none of that happened is, is very small. I don't, I don't think that's really what a denier is today. Mm -hmm. I think a denier is somebody who says, yeah, 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 the weather's changing, but the weather's always changed. There's always been cycles. I mean, there's been ice ages. Yeah. There's been spikes in carbon dioxide every 100,000 years. And that is all true. That is all a fact that that some degree of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is important for life. If, if there weren't this shell of, of greenhouse gases around the atmosphere, the earth would be a frozen ice ball. Um, and yes, every 100,000 years, there's a spike. What's different this time is if you look at the graph, uh, this spike has happened much faster, not on the scale of thousands of years, but in the last 150 years, which happens to coincide with when we started burning coal, oil, and gas. I mean, it's, a, it's an exact replica. So it's, it's happening faster than it's ever happened. And the spike is much higher. Like, like there hasn't been this much carbon dioxide in the air for 12 million years. Um, it's, it, I mean, long before we came along. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's much faster and much higher. Even so, uh, the Yale Center for Climate Communications does this survey twice a year of American attitudes toward climate change. And the, the latest report came out two days ago, and it says the number of Americans who believe that um, these are natural cycles we're witnessing is down to 29%. It's been dropping about 5 or 6% a year steadily. I think the average person would say, oh, it's half and half. It's a red state, blue state thing. It's really not. It's only 29% of the population that continues to drop. Um, slowly acceptance is setting in that we have something to do with this. I mean, that said, I don't mean to, you know, dump on the 29% who think this is all a natural cycle. Uh, if and I may say so. Not very many of my listeners, I, yeah. <laughs> I, am, I imagine, but yeah. <laughs> but I will say that for the purposes of this book, How to Prepare for Climate Change, it doesn't freaking matter. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter if you think we did this or if it's a natural cycle. Right. It's still getting intense out there and you still need to prepare. Yeah, yeah, the, the it is the change will just happen. This is all natural. It, it it's just you hear this with covid a lot too and it's like, well, 
the global travel isn't natural uh ha having this amount of biodiversity loss that's that's making a, a bunch of species get closer to cl and closer together and increasing zo zoonosis isn't natural in my book in terms of just looking back at the history of earth and you could certainly look at go well climate change happened and and ground sloths ended up becoming aquatic sloths because that's where uh there was a vegetation and the in the water that they were able to get to and then climate change happened again and those ones went extinct and then they and you kind of view this as some morphing thing over time well guess what you aren't going to just start your morphology isn't just going to start changing and adapting this was 50 million years of of time you're talking about yeah if you want to make it through this lifetime that you are stuck in in the body that you're in in the atmosphere that you're in 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 uh changing we're going to need to be aware of of some pragmatic uh, 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 predictions about what the future might hold for us. It's it's funny because you just you just answered one of those frequent questions that I get, which is what is is there a connection between the climate crisis and the COVID crisis? And you just said it. It's us pushing too close into nature. You know that we. We wouldn't lose homes and lives to wildfires if we hadn't built our houses right against the forest, mm -hmm. which 60% of Californian homes in the last 20 years have been built there. You know, we wouldn't be wiped out by hurricanes if we hadn't built right on the low lying land along the Gulf Coast, you know. So it's, 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 it's our aggression in building into the natural habitat that's caused both COVID and the climate crisis. And in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think the main pushback, so you, you have, you have outright climate denial. It's a little percentage and, and growing smaller all the time. Then you have, is this just natural? And then uh, is this man-made? And then is, is this going to affect me in my lifetime? I think there is a larger percentage of people. And then there's the, oh, there's nothing we can do about it anyway, kind of let it rip. Um, and, and so there, there's, there's gradients of the kind of it. And I know this because I've been having done a interviewed over 300 people before COVID happened and never once having someone write me and and be like I don't think your butterfly researcher knew what the hell they were talking about and never never once did but you talk about climate change or COVID or something that actually inconveniences people and all of a sudden that old motivation motivated reasoning gets real fired up and lots of denial lots of pushback and I would say to that just in the very intro of your book because people people are don't want to pay the cost of of changing things who's paying for this and this stat blew me away i'll just paraphrase it something like fema fema bought about fifty thousand homes already that are so uh, I, I guess increased flood risk and it's more expensive to have to bail these people out over and over again better to just buy their home rip it down turn it into wetland or well, i don't know what they do with it but that's it I, I could not have worded that better that is exactly what they're doing they're buying homes from you and then knocking down your house so they don't have to keep paying to rebuild that's exactly it that costs us money too yeah yeah <laughs> so we're, we're gonna pay the bill one way or another we're gonna pay it in wildfires we're gonna pay it in hurricanes there's not much escaping this yeah that's right that's right so these are um these are what i love about this is so far we've kind of been talking about this existential risk and these huge big massive uh, uh, problems let's work together and figure out how to change policy and get everyone on the same page but your book what your kind of specialty is at least within this book is what can you do we where hey are you thinking about moving here's some places you might want to avoid here's some places you might want to go to uh you're thinking about getting a new roof on your house 
hey, maybe maybe skip to this section. A uh, quick five minute reading on on uh, on on this specific area, and might give you a, a couple things that you want to tell your contractor or ask for ahead of time. Uh, you you uh, uh, you might you might be paying more for um, home insurance than you need to, and not and without getting what you actually need for our uh, for our modern world so these are these are actionable things that not only could someone do today but you don't need to read this book and be like <gasps> and be overwhelmed by all of it you can you can take a little step at a time and think hey i'm gonna do a garden this summer gardening's all the rage during this covid quarantine stuff maybe i'll maybe i'll take a peek at this section and uh and and figure out maybe what what are uh, um uh, before i figure out what vegetables i'm going to grow i'll i'll peek at this uh, really quick it's a lot of stuff like that right yeah yeah exactly it's a it's a how-to book it's a it's a reference book for sure not to say you couldn't read it cover to cover um i actually i i was the voice of the book for the audiobook like i read it and uh it took, it took 11 days. The resulting audio is 18 hours long. As you said, it is, it is not a pamphlet, this book. Um, and I was just blown away to find out. I mean, I was hearing from people on Twitter, like, just started listening to chapter one. <laughs> like, there are people who are going to listen to 18 hours of, you know, prepper for climate change. And uh, they're into it. I'm so happy you read it yourself. You get a voice actor; they really dig in a little too much into the into the books. It's a lot of like when climate change. It's they need to like do peculiar enunciations to make their <laughs> to market their distinctive voice or whatever. I always like hearing what my author actually sounds like. Um, so, what are what are the things? You go to, I love asking questions like this. Uh, uh, you, you go to a dinner party or uh, under normal conditions, uh, normal, regular life that we're definitely getting back to <laughs> one day. Yeah. You, 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 go, you go to some dinner party or whatever. Someone asks you uh, what you do, asks you about your book. What are the what are the fun little tidbits because you know you got to start with the little gems to get people hooked in a little bit and then and then you can get a little more nuanced once you have their uh, what, uh attention what are the attention grabbers what sucks people in yeah i mean i first of all you you mentioned the the problem of people who say yeah the climate may be changing but it doesn't affect me which is an incredibly good point um but 25 to 30 million Americans a year, not the same 25 to 30 million each year, but that many people are getting hit by some kind of extreme weather every year and the number is growing. So eventually you will, you will be hit. So the first thing is a free thing. You can do it in two minutes. Uh, it's an app. It's a free app from the Red Cross. You put it on your phone. It's called Emergency. It's just called Emergency. It's a really cool app. You put in your address you know, your parents' address, your work address, whatever. And it monitors that position for upcoming, incoming, extreme weather, and, and even non-weather disasters like, you know, a chemical plant explosion, nuclear leak, whatever, and gives you early warning if something is coming toward your address. So you can, you can put this thing in some phone folder and never think about it again. And then two years from now, this thing will start beeping and trying to get your attention and you will get early, early warning. You'll be one of the first people able to evacuate instead of one of the last people. It, it blows me away the number of people who mm. die in the hurricanes and the wildfires just because they didn't get word to get out. I mean, every single time this happens. So at least you won't be in that position. Uh, wow. Super cool app. Another thing um, that I tell people is that one thing that wildfires and superstorms have in common is the cell towers go down. The power goes out. The cell towers are powered by power. And so when the power goes out, they go down. So you can't communicate with your family. So another thing to do is, you know, this Saturday night at dinner, figure out where will we meet 
if we're scattered when a storm hits and we can't call each other. Just figure it out now. You know, we'll meet at the at the Taco Bell in the corner. We'll meet at the craggy tree in front of the Joneses house. Um, just know that ahead of time. Put it in your, write it down in your notes app on your phone so you can remember. Have a plan, basically. Just have a plan. Same thing if you're a small business. There's actually a chapter in the book for small businesses. Like, what would you do if you couldn't get back to your to your place of work? Would you still be able to carry on your business? Set up a reciprocal agreement with another business on, across town where if they can't use their office, they can use yours and vice versa. You know, mm. just do some planning ahead of time. And and by the way, on that uh, thing of power going out, think about a generator. It doesn't have to be one of the expensive $10,000 ones. You know, at Home Depot, for 250 bucks, you can get a, you know, a, a gas, gasoline-powered one that'll at least let your refrigerator stay cold so you don't have to throw out your food and give you some lights and give you a way to charge your phone uh, when the worst comes to pass. Might not be a bad idea anyway. I, you know, you know my biggest uh, fear. I'm not a very apocalyptic person, but I do. I, I don't know anything about this. Maybe if I learned more, I, I would know that it's probably not a, a slightly needless fear. Uh, you might, you might not know anything about space junk. Oh, the space I do. debris. Oh my god! I'm doing a story on space junk for CBS Sunday Morning right now. Yeah. Can we talk about space junk? Is that okay? I've just yeah. been thinking about it a lot lately. I know it's not your book, but uh, <laughs> but ju just just quickly um, tell people about yeah. It, it, the, work, workshop your story on me. Could it, th throw a little bit at me. Yeah, we're interviewing uh, Iridium in a couple of weeks, and I mean basically, there's a lot of space junk at the moment. It's it's doable. It's not over the top. But the problem is, you know, with SpaceX and Amazon launching these networks of satellites with the intention of giving everybody internet access all over the world, it's, it's a great gesture. But we're talking about tens of thousands of little satellites, um, cheap little satellites that will, you know, astronomers hate it because it's going to block their view of the stars. Um, and it's going to really create a space junk problem. I mean, if you've ever seen Gravity or one of the other sci-fi movies where one of our manned spacecraft gets hit by a piece of space junk, I mean, it can be devastating. It could take out our space station. Um, yeah, it's, it's something we need to start really getting serious about. You have a little bolt come off off of one of these junky satellites that you put up there to save a few bucks, and uh, I, I mean, we we all I haven't I haven't seen the docu series on the Challenger yet, but I bet people got an earful about O rings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's you know you have a little thing go wrong. Now you got some junky Home Depot bolt up in space zipping around at seventeen thousand miles an hour, flies into something else. Does it, it doesn't seem like much, but at seventeen thousand miles an hour, that can rip apart something pretty good, and and now it's just just this cascading effect. That's the, and then what what happens is we do we eventually do things just start slamming into everything else and we lose the internet i know again i know nothing about this i'm sure i sound like a fool right now no no not at all no we won't we won't lose the internet from our you know regular internet oh, like we have now okay but <laughs> okay oh. but but i mean you know once these spacex type you know networks of thousands and thousands of little satellites are in place you know those are going to get hit and they're going to hit other things. Yeah. So I, I don't, <laughs> I mean, surely the SpaceX and Amazon people are starting to think this through. I know that, that you know, with NASA and other astrophysicists, it's, it's a serious problem worth contemplating now before it gets really bad. Yeah. So not to deviate, it's just I usually, normally I'm the type that makes fun of, uh, that makes fun of like the preppers, the ones that you see on the reality shows of the building, the bunkers and stuff like yep. that. Yep. And I've, uh, COVID, I mean, those people are still insane and it didn't seem to help them in any way. Uh, once COVID rolled, I think they were the first person people like, let me out of here. <laughs> um, but, but COVID certainly opened my eyes and I'm sure a lot of people's eyes to, 
oh man, I should have a little more of a nest egg. Hey, I should have a few more of these things stored away. I should be a little prepped for uh, for entropy, not just in a physical term, but just in it's easier for a house to fall apart than to build a house than to keep a house stable. That same goes with your body and just about everything in life, your job and and everything else. And uh, and so so this is tons of this stuff is about that like where um one thing that i'm really interested in is uh is where to move <laughs> um you, you you listed some cities in here i'm i'm from the midwest i'm from right in between um La Crosse, wisconsin right in between madison and minneapolis yeah and that seems like a, a nice as, as i'm skimming through your book seems like you're liking that area for oh man for the madison uh, a lot of the experts i talked to said madison wisconsin man it is it, it not only is is so so okay so the, in the big picture if you ever do have a choice of where to relocate right you're right it's the great lakes it's the rust belt and the reason is you're far enough east from the wildfires and the droughts of the west coast you're far enough west from the hurricanes and the superstorms and the ticks and mosquitoes of the east coast and you're far enough north from the gulf coast so you don't get the hurricanes and the heat waves of the south and a really important one that doesn't occur to you at first is the entire western half of the united states has been in more or less perpetual drought like like where do we get our water well we get our water from aquifers which are these big underground storehouses of water they're at historic lows all over the world we get our water out west from the snow melt like the mountain snows of the winter melt and run through the rivers come down to us but the winters are shorter and warmer and there's not as much snow so we're getting a lot less snow melt we get it from uh reservoirs like like the hoover dam created this huge lake in Nevada called Lake Mead. It's 110 miles long, and that provides water for big chunks of Nevada and California. And Lake Mead is at one third of its normal level, and it's dropping. So you also wanna be somewhere where you'll never have to think about drinking water. So Great Lakes, man, it's all there. But, but in, in addition to the climate factors, you also wanna know, is it a good place to live, right? Cost of living, what are the people like? Do they have sports teams? Do they have culture? Do they have a good airport? Do they have good hospitals? That's an important one in the climate change era. Um, so yeah, so Madison seems to have it all. Uh, it keeps getting rated like number one quality of life by all these different websites and magazines. But you know, Cleveland and Buffalo and Duluth and Syracuse, um, Burlington, all of these cities keep coming up as not only grand old cities ready for people to move back in, but really low cost of living and great quality of life. You know, you're you're on a lake. So mm. what's not to like? I I was wondering if you could as you talked about in the beginning, like this is happening, we should do what we can um uh to mitigate it and and move to clean energy and um which, by the way, can I ask? What do you think about uh, nuclear? I'm, I, I tend to be, I'm into it. I'm excited about it. Are you? Is there? Are there things that that give you a uh, pause? Do you? Do you like it or? Yeah, no, I, I like nuclear a lot. Um, especially there are experiments being done now uh, on thorium reactors. Bill Gates is really into this. So instead of you're using uranium, which is the cause of all our you know meltdowns and public panic and stuff like that. Thorium cannot be used in weapons. And in fact, mm. that's why we didn't use thorium in the first place, right? When we were developing nuclear energy, the US government wanted something that could also be bombs. They wanted it to be bombs. So they picked uranium. <laughs> oh my God. That's so. the most depressing. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that to be the most depressing thing in a climate change conversation, but, <laughs> but continue. That's awesome. Yeah, that's right. But a thorium reactor um, doesn't melt down, doesn't have the disposal problems. In fact, what you can do is you can take the spent fuel rods from today's reactors, which believe it or not, still have like decades of life in them. 
Um, and you can recycle them into these reactors and get years worth of, of safe, clean nuclear power that can't melt down. So what? yeah, so there's, yeah. How? Look it up, baby. How thorium. have I been sleeping on thorium? Thorium I've been sleeping. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, it's really exciting. And there's some great minds working on it. If we can, if we can nail that, I mean, that would be unbelievable. I mean, it works. We just have to, you know, get the price down, get the design perfected and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I'm a big fan of nuclear. But but right now, um, you know, solar and wind are just taken over. Um, last year, here's a stat that'll fry your mind. It fried mine. Last year, 70% of all new power built in the United States was solar and wind. Mm. Clean, renewable, free energy forever. Um, and the number of new coal plants planned for the United States is zero. Like mm. the experts I talked to for this book, they're like, coal is done. There's there's no more coal. I mean, yes, I feel bad for the workers, um, but already there are more, there's more jobs in solar right now than there are in coal, first of all. And the jobs themselves are better jobs. You yeah. Know, coal mining is, it's, not fun. It's crazy. It's, it's dangerous. It's <laughs> stinky and dark and dirty. Yeah. So it's it's better jobs too. So if we can, you know, if the new administration can work out, you know, training, retraining, or or some other way to rescue the fossil fuel workers who are going to be left behind yeah. in the big transition to clean power, then everybody could win. Yeah, I. I'm a huge fan of solar. It just seems, uh, it, I, I mean, I haven't, has it come along quite a bit in the last decade oh, or man. so? It, mu it must have, right? Yeah, yeah. Because so there was the thing where everyone gave it a hard time. O Obama's solar initiative, like, didn't plan out the way that, or, or pan out the way that they had hoped, or what, I, I don't even quite remember that anymore. Yeah. But I just remember people just mocking that he tried to make solar happen in factories and stuff. I'm like, are you crazy? It's free energy <laughs> from the sun every no, day. But you're, you're absolutely right. So, so what happened with the Obama initiative is that uh, the government propped up some American solar panel companies. But what happened is the price of solar power has crashed so far, so fast, there's not an expert on the planet that predicted solar power would be so cheap by today. They thought it mm. would take another 50, 70 years to get this cheap. And one of the big reasons is, is China is the biggest producer of solar panels in the world, and they're just pumping them out. I mean, they're they're flooding the market with solar panels um it's a, it's a commodity now it's just you know no american company could hope to compete that's why the, you know the american companies kind of tanked and went out of business i mean that's too bad for the for the american initiative but it's great for the planet because mm. last year for the first time solar and wind use in america actually surpassed the burning of coal, which has been, you know, going down and down and down every year while solar and wind are going up and up and up. And that's because it's so cheap. Solar and wind have gotten way cheaper than anybody ever expected. I, I saw um, a, a couple as I was skimming through, I saw some stats on um, on uh, investing in clean energy and uh, this is this is at, at, at the time that we're recording this which by the way I'm putting this I'm I'm doing a quick turnaround on this so it's coming out like next week but um, I uh, all the rage is everyone's uh, running over to crypto and peddling the apocalyptic fears which makes crypto go up and everything and that's i i i, I like the ideas of of crypto and every i'm not i'm gonna get so many angry listeners uh like you gotta get into crypto. every time i get yelled at by conspiracy th theorists they always have <laughs> hashtag bitcoin in their in their <laughs> profile so it just makes me question the the club um but but uh but every everyone's um everyone uh, investing with GameStop and all these other cool things happening in the news um, every everyone's talking about how to invest in the future in this new world in the 
great reset or the very many names that we're giving the COVID is going to drastically change the world for better or worse i think there's going to be a lot of great things that come out of it pos- uh, um personally i think it's i think there's going to be horrific growing pains but uh i think that i think that it's an incredible opportunity um in a lot of domains and you you made the case that had you invested in clean energy compared to uh say some oil companies companies 10 years ago or whatever, uh, you would have made um, quite a bit more money. Yeah, you'd be up, uh, you'd be up 60% over the last four years. If you'd invested the same money in oil companies, you'd be down 12% for the four years. So really, the good, the good investments are in clean energy these days. And it's helping the world rather than it's my my understanding is is that the crypto isn't the most eco friendly currency in the world either. It's, I feel bad as my as my room full of servers cranking out my <laughs> my spoof bucks, which is my my own personal uh, currency that I'm, <laughs> that I'm trying wow. to mine. Spoof bucks, <laughs> get your spoof bucks today. Invest everybody. Um, but but it's it's something that you can. There's a there's a section in here about investments that you can make where you can probably better your portfolio as this seems to be where the world is heading um but you're you're doing it in doing something um uh, uh, good at the same time which is actually a, a really important point shane because like i had this long conversation with my editor about whether there should even be a chapter about how to invest in the climate change era is isn't that kind of you know tacky and elitist to, to profit from the destruction of the earth and the you know that's that's the answer is that no because when you're investing in clean companies clean technologies you're advancing their agenda you're making the world cleaner and safer um, you're bringing about a mitigation of climate change uh, and so in the end, you're, you're doing both at once. You're, you're benefiting and the planet is, is benefiting. Um, and there's some really cool stuff. By the way, I'm not an expert on any of the things in this book. You know, I'm not an investment guy. Well, let me just go and light this guy. on fire real quick. Then I'll, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, the whole, the whole thing was uh, based on interviews of people who are experts. I'm, yeah. I'm a reporter. I'm an explainer, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, it's, the, so, it's so clear in, and it's... And once again, um, just so you don't need to take any of ours or, or David's word for it, he really does have just every other page or so, there's a different link to a really reputable source in here. Of uh, So the section that you want to dig into a lot more, um, you can check. And by the time you... you uh, get through this book who knows uh, what new data there is out there or whatever else yeah that's right um well anyway so the uh the investment experts pointed out that like yeah solar is not a good investment because as we said the price keeps going down and down and down so you don't want to invest in something whose value is going to keep dropping but a bunch of states have now passed laws like california hawaii and new york have all said by 2030 they have to get 50% of their power from the whole, for the whole state from renewable sources. Mm-hmm. So think strategically, who is going to benefit from those laws? Well, it's the utility companies they're gonna be buying the power from. Mm-hmm. So there are these companies like NextEra and Excel Energy that are all in on replacing their fossil fuel power generation with solar, wind, and, and other clean energy. And here's what I love, think, think about if you're a power company, you are you don't have any raw materials for solar and wind, right? You're not buying coal or petroleum. You don't have any scrubber or federal regulations to deal with for cleaning up the emissions. So solar and wind cost you a lot less, but do you think these power companies are gonna lower your electric rates? <laughs> because their expenses mm. have gone down? No. So they're going to yeah. charge you the same, but it's the power is going to cost them less. So that means more profit. And that's why they were saying like these electric companies are a good investment. Mm. Yeah. And also you, you may have heard that, um, you know, General Motors last week announced that they're going to go all electric in the next 14 years, which is mm. phew, absolutely mind blowing. General Motors yeah. won't make gas cars anymore. And 
all of the I mean, all of the car companies are going electric. So you might think, well, maybe we invest in the batteries because they're all going to need batteries. And there are only four companies that make car batteries for electric cars, and they're all Asian um, Panasonic, Samsung, LG Chemical and so on. Or you could even think farther upstream and you could invest in the lithium mining companies because all the batteries are made from, they're all lithium ion batteries. So there are these mining companies like Albemarle and this Chilean mining company that, that take investment and they're, they're the ones digging out the lithium. So it's mm. very possible to think strategically. Yeah, and th this is why people tend to like Warren Buffett more than hedge fund managers because he's <laughs> investing. In, hey, this isn't to whatever. I'm not telling people to go and invest in McDonald's or whatever awful <laughs> garbage he often does. But but the idea is, is he does invest in American jobs and stuff like rather than someone um, just just trying to make a buck off of uh, off of. Uh, the world falling apart or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of uh, trying to make the world a better place, there's, um, I don't know your thoughts on um, uh, kind of effective altruism. There's, there's tons of, you know, every, everything is uh, going green and there's, there's, it, it's it's trendy to make things uh you know throw that organic sticker on something or uh or whatever else it, and it, or natural put the word natural on something and there's all of these well-meaning and and pleasant this isn't to crap on any of it i do think that organic and oh man i've been it, the the homeopathic people have been driving me a little bit crazy through uh through all of this as i've been trying to get people to take vaccines so that i can work again and pack people into a club <laughs> shoulder to shoulder without masks on and i'd prefer they didn't put uh garlic lemon spritzer on their whatever to make them invincible but uh but whatever i I'm gonna, you're gonna get emails for that I'm, i'll get emails <laughs> i have a bunch of hippies in my audience and i love them I, I i've intentionally done that to myself because they're the finest people on earth but uh i still there the the point is is there's things that we do um that are well-meaning um that that don't actually do what we had hoped they do you know everyone knows there's charity organizations that end up you know 90 percent of the money goes to um it goes to uh administration fees or or someone someone sets up you know there's all these stories come out of of someone taking advantage of people using GoFundMe or whatever. Um, if someone wants to uh, uh, contribute and, and do actual, not just invest in solar, but they actually really want to uh, take part in an altruistic act and get involved with no profits or <laughs> no profits, <laughs> non profits. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the no profits <laughs> business. I invest in spoof bucks today. <laughs> I'm a, <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 do you have any, do you have any tips for them? Yeah. Um, and actually th there's a, the first chapter of, of this book is how to acclimate to climate change. It deals with what they call eco despair or climate grief. I mean, there are people who are really worried about the planet, who are really upset by what's going on. And, y you know, the, the pundits tell you, well, change your light bulbs to LEDs and take public transportation instead of driving. And yeah, I mean, if we all did that, that would make a dent. But basically, you're far more effective saving the planet as part of a group than through individual action. And not only that, but when you join a group and, and the, you know, as you, as you say, the book is full of these recommendations like um, Al Gore's organization is, is called Climate Reality, and they do the, this really cool thing. You know, Al Gore has specialized for decades now in communicating with the public about the climate change, and he has his fa famous slideshow that was the basis of the movie An Inconvenient Truth. Well, what you can do, and you can do this right now for free, you can sign up to take his course that he he personally teaches you 
to give his slideshow. So mm. his his idea is make thousands of mini Al Gore's out there who are equipped to understand and explain climate change uh, to the public in their own, own local communities. I took this course last July. It's all virtual now. You can do it from home. Used to be you had to fly to whatever city he was doing it in. And super interesting and super fun, totally free. And again, you're making a difference by influencing a lot of people instead of just doing things one at a time by yourself. Of course, your voting record makes a big difference, not just the presidential elections, but you know your school board makes a difference. 50% of schools still don't talk about the climate crisis um, in, in the classroom. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can get active with groups that use collective power to make changes. And you know, my, my editor calls How to Prepare for Climate Change the first uplifting book about climate change. And what she's talking about is taking any kind of action is an antidote for depression. Like, like depression isn't just feeling like your situation sucks. It's feeling like your situation sucks and you're helpless to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so by taking any kind of action, like preparing yourself, preparing your family, installing that app, looking over your insurance, joining one of these groups, you feel like you are taking some control of the situation and you feel better. Mm. So even if you take steps to prepare for climate change that you never need, like let's say you make go bags, which is something else they talk about, you know, an emergency bag you keep in the front closet that would let you survive out of the house for a couple of days. If they, if they make you evacuate, you can just grab it and go. Like even if you never need it, knowing that you've built it and that it's ready makes you feel better, makes you feel more controlled of your life. Yeah, I got this. Uh, I, I did a episode um, uh, just at the beginning part of the year uh, using your smartwatch to uh, through Stanford Health um, to oh. monitor your uh, to monitor your health. So I'll I should theoretically get an alert if I um, if I have a change in my heart rate that is a, po a, a potential indicator that I have a cold or COVID or Lyme's disease before I actually have symptoms. That's so, so cool. That's it, so cool. So not only not only would I then be able to quarantine so I don't get anyone else sick uh, and hopefully other people would adopt this. So people, I hope that after COVID gone are the days when people come into work sniffling and sneezing and powering through it. I don't think we're going to see that anymore, but this is next to level and you can show this to your boss to be like i'm not faking it here's my <laughs> here's my fitbit uh thing which people might have some uh, privacy issues with that but for me it, it um it to be able to also get a jump on say something like covid where there's different stages of of prevention you know there if you catch it early on it's different than if if you have a moderate thing which is different than if you have a, a severe condition and i i can see climate kind of having these uh, you know, having various apps and having these alerts built in in the same way where if you're in Miami, you might need a, a higher uh, threat level detection or whatever, or, or uh, be on higher alert or a greater sense of urgency than, than if you're in Madison. If you're in New Orleans, you might need to be prepping year round for the next hurricane, whereas uh, uh, um, Alaska might bring about different things. Speaking of uh, Al Alaska, um, th this is uh, in, in climate denial. I've been to Alaska a few times, and you would think Alaskans would be the most in denial about climate. Not at all. They're, they're seeing it as uh, salient as probably um, anyone in the country uh, outside of maybe New Orleans or something like that, because they they have. Uh, it's my understanding that it, the it's kind of more dramatic the closer you get to the poles. That's right? exactly right. That's exactly right. The farther north you are, the faster the warming is, and Alaska is. I mean, they have serious problems with the permafrost melting. Yeah. All the buildings are built on what they thought was solid ground forever, but as it turns to mush, um, I visited Fairbanks for a for a Nova special, and uh, I mean all the buildings are 
tilting at these crazy angles because the ground beneath them is, is sinking and turning to mud. They have wildfires in Alaska. Alaska! Serious wildfire problems. Yeah, climate change is hitting, hitting the Alaskans hard. Hmm. Um, oh, I brought up limes. Um, and and we, when we talked about zoonosis um, earlier and, and climate and biodiversity loss impacting um, potentially, well, it's also uh, industrialized farming and everything too, and creating this Petri dish uh, 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 that, that we then eat out of. Um, uh, what's, uh, I'm, so I'm in Wisconsin right now, dreaming about summer and being able to hike <laughs> and paddleboard and everything. And, and uh, last year, I've I've been a pretty fearless, reckless person my entire life, and uh, and COVID's been my time to be like, you know what? I'll just I'll I'll playing it safe will be this adventure, this phase of my adventure, uh, and because of that, I've 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 uh, taken on becoming aware of just my personal health a little more and watching out for things. And I didn't know how much limes there was in my, I, I haven't, I'm, I'm back living in my hometown where I haven't been in 20 years or something. And I didn't realize uh, how much limes there is around. I guess it's been getting worse and worse. I noticed a section about, um, uh, about ticks in your book could you talk a little bit about what why is i didn't read it what what's climate change have to do what are ticks doing in a book about climate change oh yeah listen i i live in connecticut i'm 20 minutes from lime old lime connecticut the town for which lime <laughs> disease is named um, oh, no. yeah man that's right here <laughs> ground zero uh you yeah smart I can, watch <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah i can talk for hours about lime disease my, my wife says i'm a gas at parties um, <laughs> the uh so climate change in general is making the insect population that used to be confined to southern warmer latitudes they're, they're allowing them to move north and yeah. in the case of of ticks it's not so much the ticks as the deer they ride on are moving north the winters are milder the populations aren't being cut down as much in the winter um and lyme disease is really awful uh, both as a disease and because you know, it's this great imitator. You can't really tell if you have it. There are there are two tests and neither one is very accurate. And the results depend a lot on when you get the test. In other words, if you get bitten by a tick and you get the test right away, the accuracy, accuracy is very poor. Um, but a few weeks later, you're, you're it can't, it, there's no test that can tell if you have the Lyme bacteria. It's all they can tell is if you have the antibodies to the bacteria mm. so um so six weeks later you can get the test and it'll say oh yeah you've got the antibodies but by then you're sick and mm. <laughs> and the only way you can stop lyme disease is by massive doses of antibiotics right at the beginning so it's it's an awful disease it can it can stick with you the rest of your life and you never get better um it's actually the thing i found out is that it's surprisingly easy to avoid getting lyme disease for example Ticks do not fly, they do, they do not jump, they do not even have eyes. Like people are like, oh, don't go for a walk in Connecticut, those ticks are up in the trees and they'll jump down on you. No, they don't go up in trees. They sit at ground level. They hang standing. out. Yeah, exactly, with their little hands up, trying to feel for an animal passing by. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. They kind um, of, I, I think they, they, they almost, um... They almost hibernate just waiting, right? I I think is it ticks that do this? I, I'm not and, sure. And then and then when something when something brushes the plant that they're on or whatever, they just come yeah. alive and grab on. Yeah, they they grab on, and if they do bite you, <clears throat> first of all, not all ticks carry Lyme disease, um, and even not all of the black deer ticks, the one that do carry Lyme disease, not all of them carry Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. But if you are bitten. The tick has to be on you for 48 hours, for two days, for you to get mm. Lyme disease. So the, the simple thing is when you get back from a hike, take off your clothes, shove them in the dryer for 10 minutes because heat and dehumidity kill ticks 
like crazy. And while you're standing there naked, look over yourself, look in your furry parts, and f look especially for the little tiny nymph ones, the little tiny ones, and get them off you. Take a pair, a pair of ply, uh, tweezers and just pluck them out by the head. Don't use any of the things on the internet like Vaseline or using a match, none of that stuff. Just pull it out with a pair of tweezers and you won't get Lyme disease. So mm. there's, and, and by the way, the other thing is, if you'd rather not get bitten in the first place, the, the common advice is wear long pants and tuck them into your socks. Yeah, that'll stop the ticks, but are you really gonna do that on a 90 degree day? Wear long pants, nobody does that advice. But what you can do is just wear repellent, yeah. DEET-based yeah. re repellent. It does, it's, it's a safe chemical, it doesn't kill anything, it just repels them and it works. So the stuff on the uh, all all of the organic stuff being uh, being peddled <laughs> will not help you. Nope, nope. Uh, <laughs> Eucalyptus oil, lemon oil. Nope. It well, has to have deep. For for my many many hippie friends and listeners, I do think <laughs> going back to the um, altruism. One of one of the things about you know saying getting together and doing good and and creating change is is it's as, as someone that um, uh, was kind of averse to church uh, my my whole life. There's a group groups like this being a part of a cause, being a part of an organization, is such a great way to uh, meet bright intelligent people that care about the world this is everything that the new agey community has going for it you know they're awesome people you have you go to burning man you get to have a great time and everything else and uh and and that's that's one of the things that i'd also love to encourage and the I think you also mentioned um, kind of getting a little more involved in your in your town hall um and uh city council meetings that absolutely that sort yeah. of thing yeah and if you if you do do investments um you can also get involved with the you know the shareholder meetings you can raise your hand like electronically and say what are you doing company about climate change like we deserve we the investors need to know so every level like from school board to your your local street to the local town administration, every single one of these units listens to its citizens and their concerns. And if you bring up the, the climate crisis and what are we doing about it, eventually they're gonna have to listen to you. I love the idea of, I hope that parents get this and seriously consider bringing it to the school board because I, when I said seventh grade earlier, I hope I was clear in that, in that I, I just think that that would be kind of a minimum barrier to entry, but I think it would be I think it would be great for high schoolers or any any grade on up. I think that it, it's really because you can look through this; it's read readable, but it has all of these terrific statistics. I could see these statistics being used in math class. I could see I could see there being in home ec or uh, in shop class uh, taking on um, projects. I think that would have changed my whole school experience if there would have been something like that where each class is showing you know showing a little bit of it in history class in sociology class uh, uh talking about the this class that i took about the psychology of climate change was mostly just about cognitive biases and things that apply to so many things in hmm. uh in in life and our um uh, the the many ways in which we err in interpreting our uh, objective realities and and so much of my problem in school I didn't go to college or anything and my aversion to school was when am I going to use this stuff I loved math because I could see it I could feel it you got it you had a solution you knew if you're right or not you showed your work you knew how to get there I didn't like the Christopher Columbus like propaganda narratives and all these like weird it, it, I just didn't care I didn't see what the use was in any of that and something like this is something that that all, you could take all of these domains and actually apply them to here's things that we can do um, today school projects that we can do that also lead to creating a better future for all of us it's, it's funny you should say that um, in my other life I'm uh, 
you know, as we mentioned, a correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning, and I'm I'm doing a story about um, MasterClass, that thing that advertises on Instagram and Facebook, where you pay to take online classes where they're, they're videos by really, really famous people, you know, Serena Williams and Helen Mirren and so on. And I was interviewing the, uh, the CEO of the company for this story. And he said, a lot of people don't understand that there's a difference between education and learning. Mm -hmm. And Shane, I think what you do, like, is you are a learner. I mean, the, the number of books, classes, interviews the your brain is is like this intellectual sponge so i don't think i mean i don't think you need to feel anything about not having done the college thing because yeah. you've made up for it 10 times over with the learning that you do it's it's kind of stunning uh well, thank you. I, I, I just, uh, this why it's part of one of my missions now is to, uh, be a home for other people that didn't, weren't the right fit for, for school and didn't quite, I have tons of listeners that are, uh, working in factories or our truck drivers or and that's not to uh, a lot of people took those jobs just because they the i mean driving forklift was one of the best jobs that i ever had i hmm. think about going back it, if i if i was to pick a job other than what i do it would be either crane operator or sloth researcher probably <laughs> but ask me <laughs> ask me in a month and that will change but <laughs> but so so i don't want to like disparage so I've, I've done tons of factory work and whatnot but the feedback that i get from a ton of people leads me to believe that some of the most intellectually curious people on earth just didn't resonate with the classic education system and i i sure wish that there were a it, issues like this i think are are something that you could you could show a multi-level how information pieces together because i'm i'm not a expert in anything but i'm i'm pretty i'm a decent interdisciplinary um thinker because i can see the pieces shaping together and i think that's what i think that's the same a lot of my listeners seem to be in the same boat. They weren't ever going to be straight A students, but they get these concepts really well. And school, at least 25 years ago, where I went to school wasn't quite designed <laughs> for that. It was a lot of memorize the thing that you, the very specific details that you need to know for the test, and then have that fall right out of your head afterwards and memorize the next thing. Right. Um, and and we have to admit that in, in terms of sloth digestion, you're way ahead of the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, I do know quite a bit about <laughs> sloths. So, uh, one thing as we're as we start wrapping up um in terms of predicting the future um one of the things that i'll hear people say is well no one knows exactly what's going to happen and although it's true and although it's there science seems all over the place in terms of um okay, we know this is going to be bad. How bad is it going to be? There are things that we do. I mean, we know what Earth has looked like being eight degrees warmer. It has been warmer in the past, and we know what coastal lines have looked like at that time. We know the amount of desertification that has happened at those times. We know what ocean levels looked like at those times. We, we don't know what it looks like in a modern metropolitan <laughs> in environment exactly but we do have a, a little bit of a sense of things so what what kind of uh what things feel concrete to you in terms of uh, i i know you you looked um you were talking about seawalls and stuff in the in the beginning you have you have mar mar -a lago out on uh in florida there are we are we gonna have uh maybe 2024 it will be we're gonna we're gonna build the seawalls and make the ocean pay for it is that gonna be the next 
<laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, Florida is out of luck when it comes to seawalls because the in in many of the parts of the state, the the ground itself is porous, so the, uh. the sea comes from underneath you, uh, so you can't seawall against that. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, of predicting the future, you're right. The the IPCC, the you know the United Nations prediction body, um, drew these graphs that show greater and worse amounts of death and destruction depending on variables that we can't predict. But the one thing we know for sure is that it's not going to get better than it is right now. Like yeah. it's either this or this and worse. Um, and I think that's really the message of this book is, you know, disasters coming, you don't know when, so you may as well prepare for it now and sleep better at night. Um, I interviewed the, the head of um, a, a fire chief with Cal Fire, that's California's wildfire department. <laughs> and I said, well, that this horrific fire season has finally just wound down. Are, are you guys internally at Cal Fire, are you all slapping each other on the back and saying, well, thank God that's over. And he's like, no, you, <laughs> you don't understand that that we just lived through, that's the baseline for the future. It's gonna get six times worse than that yeah. by the middle of the century. Right. So you, we gotta stop thinking of these things as flukes, as, as yeah. intense, weird weather. It, it's the new normal weather. Oh, this is... Uh, How many cats do you have over there? <laughs> it's just one cat. Oh, just he's, the one? Oh, just, I thought it was twin cats that they do, he just moves around about. No, yeah, those of you yeah. watching on video, I, I apologize. Wilbur <laughs> insists on being between me and the camera at all times. Oh, no. Anyone watching on video, congratulations. You just got to... <laughs> I, I apologize to anyone listening on audio. <laughs> so, Shane, I kid you not, I gave, a, I gave a talk over Zoom the other night for this sort of hoity-toity uh, organization. And when it was over, the organizers sent me a note and said, well, thank you very much for addressing our group. Next time, perhaps show us the respect of locking your cat in another room. Show us the respect. What are you talking about? They thought it was oh, totally my... unprofessional to be able to see someone's cat. And I'm like, dude, this is the <laughs> pandemic. Okay. I love our new measures of professionalism. <laughs> To, I mean that is that's a decent that's that's a loose it used to yeah you used to have to like dress up in a suit and yeah. Uh, yeah put on a tie and all that now it's just like hey can you keep your cat off your lap for <laughs> for yeah. an hour but no the, the new rules are like a cat children and pets in the background are allowed if you didn't get the memo during the pandemic they yeah. are allowed um but anyway yeah so no one knows exactly what's going to happen but if you are an individual a family a small business you can take for granted that it's going to be like this but worse mm, yeah i i mean speaking of zoom cats and and working um remotely do you have anything everyone in the beginning was um all my uh all my hippie friends in the beginning were like life is coming back and look at all of the green and there's rabbits everywhere and and i was like okay i mean that's that's cool that we get to see the uh, smog clearing from areas and stuff and and get a get a snapshot of of what things look like but whenever there's economic turmoil people use that as as an excuse to just gut every environmental policy because you can just you can just sell off land and environmental protections to the highest bidder and there's always someone bidding on them yeah i mean i think uh i think a wise man in fact i think it was you 20 minutes ago who said that that some of the pandemic changes that we've made to our society are going to last mm -hmm. and i think you know some of the greenhouse gas emission reduction that we experienced during the great lockdown will last because not all companies are going to go back to office meetings. You know, there will be a lot more people who realize, you know, we got by just fine with our workers at home. So so that will help. And I think the the drop in the, you know, as, as you say, we could suddenly see fish in the bottom of rivers and in LA, you could see blue sky in the mountains for the first time because 
because we had a 17% global drop in, in greenhouse emissions at, at one point last year. Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of showed us that we do have our hand on the lever. Like we are controlling how much yeah. pollution we're pumping out. And if we have the will, we can we can lower that level and lower lower the emissions. I do feel, I mean, I don't care what anyone's politics are listening here, but I do feel like it's pretty obvious that the Biden administration takes climate change really seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have got, they have plucked the best minds and scientists from every field. They're installing climate change considerations into everything the government does. Um, and it's important, I think, not just for the United States, but for the message we send to China and India, the other two giant polluters, that we're serious about it. You know, for mm. I, I keep hearing like, why should we make changes to our lifestyle when China's over there polluting? Well, yeah, true. But you know what? China's president just said they just announced they intend to be carbon neutral by 2160. I mean, mm. in our lifetimes. Um, and so it's it's becoming a healthy competition now between these big powers and it's going to be better for all of us yeah it, it will be nice to see that's another thing that's come raging to the surface um for me that i've been mindful of during all of this is just how important social fairness is to yes. people uh to uh, to us these social animals because to me when i see a bunch of idiots who think it's spring break on myrtle beach uh <laughs> getting together and having parties during a pandemic i go oh great now i gotta hunker down for that much longer because of the because the morons get the idiocracy gets to throw themselves a parade during a pandemic all, all of a sudden everyone that i can't get off the couch uh to come out to a show or whatever under normal conditions is like it's party time we all got to get out there and there's something about that that makes everyone go well then i'm gonna get out there too like no no it means the opposite <laughs> The more dummies there are out there doing the wrong thing, unfortunately, the harder you have to work, the more of an anchor you have to drag toward the off of the cliff. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. You don't just get to be like, "Well, I get two too." Then, um, <laughs> bunch of babies. What? What? Uh, here's here's something that I heard. Um, uh, someone say recently i'm wondering your take on this i bet this isn't in your book um it's regarding overpopulation which i tend to uh i, I i'm i'm for i'm for uh less kids my both both of my parents were like one of seven or eight or something like wow. that wow and um and my my grandparents something like that you'd think you'd know right um <laughs> <laughs> I have an uncountable number of cousins. <laughs> um, and it's funny because, like, both of my, all, all my grandparents are just like, I just like small town living and all that. And like, well, you created a town, like, out of your body. You shot a small town out of your body. <laughs> and, and, like, you didn't want to be, you made the big city. Like, and, uh so here's the thing i was listening to a podcast recently it was a little bit it was a little bit like red pillish i just wanted to hear what they had to say about things and um i tend to uh i tend to skew pretty far left i'm i'm coming to terms with more and more every day it seems but uh if i'm being honest with myself full disclosure and um but i listened to this kind of red pill ish oh we gotta look at the other side sort of thing and there's a you know very bright person on um talking about they're like well everyone's panicked about overpopulation but you know that just means there's more geniuses are going to pop up and these geniuses are the ones that we depend on to fix everything 
Like, are you crazy? First, you don't even know what genius means. <laughs> Everyone thinks genius is like Albert Einstein or something. Genius is an idea that that you grab onto, usually through a bunch of cooperation. And genius is implementing good ideas and not kicking and screaming against change or telling yourself fanciful stories about why we don't need to change any of our behavior and that the very people that you're counting on to fix all of our problems are the same people that you're fighting against in every policy all along the way and i just i don't get this idea i think that seven point i i think what is it seven billion people or something like yeah, that seven point eight yeah i bet we have enough geniuses at, <laughs> you know think- like that exist right now that we could take these seven billion and, and create policy that that creates a fertile environment for geniuses to uh to thrive in and help us i'm not sure we need 10 billion people for there to be the correct allotment of geniuses <laughs> to get us out of this overpopulation pickle uh do you have any do you have any takes yeah well I, I happen to agree with you i think that's a goofy argument um and what i will say is that at the same time as we're approaching 10 billion people please remember that the land mass they can live on is shrinking yeah. I don't mean I don't mean just sea level rise eating up the shoreline. I mean the inhabitable area, the areas of the planet where we can grow stuff, is baking away in climate change. Um, there are there are new places that are opening up to agriculture, like Greenland, where you could never grow anything before. But meanwhile, you know, Middle Eastern countries, African countries, you you won't be able to grow anything there, um, and that's going to cause uh, huge, huge shifts of hundreds of millions of people leaving uninhabitable areas, moving to the new habitable areas. Um, and, you know, really serious think tank people are quite worried about wars and conflicts um, that that will result. One of the experts I spoke to for the for the book was as big a Trump hater as you could find. But he did say sooner or later, we're going to need to build that wall. Mm-hmm. on the southern yeah. border not not to keep out mexicans but to keep out central americans south americans everybody fleeing the uninhabitable parts of the earth to get into more temperate regions yeah it's uh it's it's a horrifying um uh, reality that probably will uh be coming i i they're gonna build the wall on canada is what that's yeah what that's right what they they're are. going to do <laughs> that's right yikes uh not to, not to mention the south is like so you know the, the the things near the equator are so riddled with all of the tropical diseases and parasites and everything else any already to in to keep increasing that in places man uh yeah Huh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, any, anything you want to? Um, uh, why don't Why don't you plug all your any? By the way, if there was any open loops, I think we covered all of uh, all of climate change, all of existence, the meaning of life. I think we got it all uh, squared away pretty well. But if there was any, um, if there's anything that open loops out there that you want to put a nice little bow on, do that. But I want to make sure and uh, plug the heck out of all, all of the projects you got going. I want people to be able to find you and learn more about your many things that you do. Well, that is very kind of you. Um, I'm right in the mid- I'm the host of a, a Nova science series on, on PBS called Beyond the Elements. It's a kind of a micro series. There's three episodes and the last one is uh, Wednesday the 17th. I'm not sure when this will this will drop. But anyway, um, and, uh, you know, the book is called How to Prepare for Climate Change. And I would like to make a special offer to your listeners because we cannot meet in public to have, you know, book signings and bookstore meetings. If anyone is interested in having your copy of the book autographed by me, like made out to you as a gift or whatever, um, just email me. It, my, it, the email address is very simple. It's my last name, Pogue, P-O-G-U-E, like Vogue with a P, Pogue at me.com, M-E. So Pogue at me.com and give me your address and you know proof of purchase and I will autograph a sticker and mail it to you. 
U.S. mail, and you can slap that in the front of the book like like I autographed. So, uh, a little, what a great idea! A little That's personal awesome. offer for you guys. Well, when I um, let me know, I usually I usually tour with a show called Stand Up Science, where I have um, it's half scientists and and half uh, half comedians. Wow. I'm, I'm, cha- I'm changing the format a little bit, but. Um, uh, but anyway, that, that's the that's the gist of the show. It's half comedy and half science, and really, my favorite part is the Q and A. It, it, it's it's like it's it's very much like this, but just with um, um, uh, I, I I I maybe I throw in a few more punchlines and stuff in front <laughs> of the live audience when I have the timing and stuff to play with, and then yeah. and we also open it up to questions and everything. And so, man, I hope. Uh, wh- where are you based out of? I live in Connecticut. Oh well, if I uh, once this opens up and I start touring again, which is probably next year that I'm going to start touring again. Um, uh, hopefully, if I if when I come through uh, the Northeast, I'd love to have you join me and and uh, and do some. It's my shows are more fun than your average book signing um <laughs> that's so, not saying much <laughs> and, and you'll sell a lot more books too so <laughs> well, i'd love uh, to we join you do that yeah awesome um well great well thank you david so much for joining me thank and, you man yeah and thank you listeners for being such wonderful curious people we'll talk with you next week All right, so everybody, sorry for, uh, there's a fun, sad story why there's a bit of a delay with the podcast this week. Uh, uh, Let me introduce you to my editor, Matt McCool. And do you prefer listeners call you Matthew or Matt? I think Matt is fine. Okay, listeners, you can call him Matt. And he is in Dallas, Texas. And so ironically and fitting at the same time we just got done he just finished what happened down there you're sitting there you're slaving away on the here we are podcast editing learning all this great stuff about preparing for uh climate apocalypse and then what happened we lost power and um it was actually funny because the the day before you recorded with with David, uh, there was like a really big wreck in Fort Worth. It's like 133 cars. I think six people died, um, and this is all because of weather. And then literally a day later, you had a conversation with with David about like preparing for climate change and all this kind of I jinxed it yeah you (laughs) you jinxed it. it's my fault no no um (laughs) it's just it's just like like kind of like all uh coincidental timing we we typically don't have to worry about this kind of thing like I I lived in Colorado for a couple years and they they have this kind of weather figured out I know I used to live in Austin and I I would go to Dallas quite a bit and anytime there was like a inch of snow on the ground or the interstate or something it was no one knew what to do with themselves yeah like it takes almost nothing to completely knock out you know half the state yeah but when things like this happen it's it's just like it's a huge deal and it seems like things this big of a deal are happening like closer together like exponentially (laughs) and it's just scary like and, and so, like, whenever I was, um, you know, going through this podcast, like, I didn't, I didn't have, we, we had power and everything, and I knew this was coming. I knew, like, people were saying, like, it's going to get really cold, and you're probably going to lose your power. Oh, they knew ahead of time you are probably going to lose the power? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. I haven't been following the news. Half of it was, like, intentional, because they were trying to uh, soften the, the, the burden you know, on on all of the power grids. And so they, they intentionally shut off certain grids that didn't have like a hospital or like things that are essential. Um, they're like, hey, we really need power for these things. So, you know, this neighborhood is just going to have to go black. Um, and so part of it was intentional. They, they just couldn't keep up with, with uh, you know, the, uh, the energy consumption because like, everyone has their heaters like full blast. 
on, on Monday, the entire state of Texas used 69,000 uh, megawatts of energy in, in an hour. Sounds like a lot. I don't have a basis of Me comparison. neither. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I have no idea what that really means, but apparently it's like way too much. Megawatt doesn't even sound like a real word. It's such a cartoonish description of... You're just like putting <laughs> words together. So you're kind of telling me on the on the phone that this was this was rather eye opening to not just hear this podcast and everything about kind of prepping for extreme weather and finish rendering the file and now you're in a situation that was it was it happened I'm sure uh, under normal conditions but more of these events happen because of uh, because of global warming and more extreme conditions mm -hmm. and and you're being acutely impacted uh, by the very sort of thing that we were just talking about. And here you are without a gen generator. It's nice to hear the podcast about getting a generator 30 minutes after you need that information. <laughs> I could have done this podcast like a month ago and maybe it would have inspired you to go out and get a generator, but. Yeah, I mean, I was editing and researching. Usually what I do is like I'll edit and kind of like every time he cites something, I try to like get some kind of resource for it for like a screenshot or whatever. And um, I was like, I should probably get a, a generator and like Home Depot's everywhere are closed. Like nothing is open. You can't, you can't, you can't get anything, you know, like, yeah. like hospitals are like just about the only thing and gas stations are like the only thing that are open. And you have, you have food, you have food in the microwave being refrigerated in your microwave for when the record comes on, you can go and quick hit start and heat up some tea and some food or whatever and get something warm in your body before they shut the power off again. That's kind of your situation. Yeah. Uh, we've been eating like tuna salad and chips and crackers and, uh, you know, everything that's either cold or room temp, which, you know, our, our, the temperature of our rooms are like 40 degrees. So that's a refrigerator. Um, I also, uh, you know, we uh, we talk about um, uh, things like this uh, on the show, and then your power goes out. We've talked about COVID plenty. You got COVID. You're alive. You got a you got a good. You got a mild ish COVID. Yeah. But I now I'm I'm just a little bit nervous about what topics I'm going to pick from now on. Because... I didn't get stung by a murder hornet. So. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, well, until, until that, those words shot out of your mouth. <laughs> now you're going to go and visit Washington to get away from the cold apocalypse in Texas and get stung by a murder hornet. Well, uh, I, I appreciate your work, my friend. You do a great job. I just wanted the listeners to, to see, uh, to one, put a face to the... the uh, editing the some of the sausage being made behind the uh the here we are podcast this sausage fest behind the sausage being made and i wanted uh, i wanted people to actually uh, you know it's easy to it's easy to read a book and hear a thing and be like yeah we're supposed to okay everyone go get a generator but it certainly adds a little something I mean, statistics just don't do it for a lot of humans you know you you need that personal story so um if you can please just upload this when the power comes on um and before you die and then i promise to say nice things <laughs> at your uh, memorial um and i hope the frostbite puts you into some sort of a hibernation sort of thing so it's it's not too terribly painful yeah thanks that that's all i ask yeah <laughs> i'm very thoughtful yeah um well well, thank you very much, Matt. Thanks. Thank you, listeners, for being awesome.